It being a little after 6 p.m., we'll go ahead and call to order the 2019 budget session to order for the Winnebago County Board of Supervisors. Um, please, um, all members, if you could press your attend button and also if you could silence any cell phones. First items on the agenda are the Pledge of Allegiance followed by the invocation by Supervisor Locke. If you could please stand. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Supervisor Locke. We come to you tonight asking for your guidance, wisdom, and support as we begin this 2019 budget meeting for Winnebago County. Help us to engage in meaningful discussion. Allow us to grow closer as a group and nurture the bonds of our communities. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Supervisor Locke. Next item on the agenda is the adoption of the agenda for this evening. I will call on Supervisor Robo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll move for the approval of this evening's agenda. Second. There's a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Moving on down to the next item, which is an opportunity for the public to speak opportunity for the public to speak on anything on the agenda this evening or anything under the jurisdiction of the county government. Is there anyone who wishes to speak? Sir? And if you could please state your name and address for the record, please, sir. Hi, my name is Donnie Burke. Uh, I'm here with my wife, Becky, and our six kids. Um, I'm standing before you tonight. Oh, I'm sorry. I, we live at 820 Dove Street here in Oshkosh. Um, good evening. Uh, I'm standing here to make the case uh, regarding an amendment that will be filed before this uh, committee. To my knowledge, uh, an amendment will be put forth to acquire the land at uh, 770 East County Road Y, um, also known as Sunnyview Road. This property, sorry, this property is currently uh, for sale and. Um, you're looking at a family that's currently interested in buying it, but we are currently competing against a verbal offer from the county. Um, I have a printout as to what it is our plans and intents are with this land. Um, but basically, all of our hopes and dreams are staked on this property in terms of making it a, an agritourism uh, property as well as a, a home for our kids for the next foreseeable future. It's the house that my wife and I would I'd like to believe that we could call our last one, and it, it has come to my attention that this will be brought up at some point during the, the budget. Um, and I do have uh, something I wrote up, just our intents with the land, and I'm hoping that you oppose um, the acquisition of this property. Thank you. I, is it possible to submit? A absolutely. You, you could bring that forward, and, and the county clerk will take it, and we'll make certain uh, that all members receive that information. Thank you very much for your comments. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Please. And if you could state your name and address for the record, please. Uh, good evening. My name is Lynn Beyer, and um, my home address is 628 Second Street in Menasha. Um, and I am here on behalf of Reach Counseling Services and an amendment that we were hoping the, um, the board would address. And Reach is asking for a one-time $45,000 um, increase to the current grant that we receive in order to hire a new therapist. Um, this won't cover all the costs of the therapist, that it will cover some of the costs of this therapist to work with um, Winnebago clients specifically and also clients that are referred to us through the county. Um, this is important for us. The work that we do here is um, 
even though it extends beyond Winnebago County, this has been our home. REACH has been here for 40 years and we've partnered with the county for all 40 of these years working on issues of abuse, um, sexual abuse, domestic violence, and specifically the trauma that results from that. So we are hoping that um, this amendment will go through for the one-time request because it is so necessary to meet the needs of the clients here in the county. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak? Is there anyone else who wishes to speak on anything on the agenda or anything under county jurisdiction? I'll say one more time, is there anyone who wishes to speak? Then we'll close that portion of the agenda and we'll move on down to reports from committees, commissions, and boards. Is there anyone who has a report from a committee, commission, or board? I'll call on Supervisor Finch. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It wasn't for that, but uh, I had had a question for the gentleman back there. That, that spoke? Oh. Uh, well, that, that portion is already, I, I apologize. I, I didn't. Well, okay, then. Then I have really not a whole lot to say. Okay. Thank you. Any other reports from committees, commissions, and boards? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda, which is the county board chairman's report. So first of all, did want to let you know that Supervisor Hogan and Supervisor Gabert asked to be excused tonight. Um, also want to let you know that tomorrow is county government day. So students from throughout the county will be here touring our facilities and learning about county government. Did want to let you know that the American Legion will be sponsoring a luncheon tomorrow. So it'll be at the American Legion post tomorrow at noon. Uh, certainly all of you have already been invited to attend. Uh, it's $6.50 for a ticket. I know the county clerk does have some of the tickets uh, uh, that you could purchase either tonight or certainly tomorrow. Uh, the students will be with us after, immediately after lunch. So after lunch is finished, they'll come in here, take your all seats, and we'll talk a little bit about county board uh, 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 function uh, um, and roles uh, with them. And then wanted to give you uh, kind of an overview uh, of the approach to the county budget, uh, um, both tonight uh, um, and uh, tomorrow and, and potentially Wednesday as, as well. So as you saw from the, the county clerk, we've laid out some areas that we're looking to go over tonight. Now, we don't know, obviously, whether or not, time permitting, whether that is a realistic uh, goal to get through all those or not. But some of them, of course, deal with departments that the department heads will be here uh, throughout the budget process. For example, the corporation council, the clerk, uh, uh, obviously the county executive. And so um, those, those departments we may end up doing tonight, depending on the timing uh, as to how things go with the other departments, or potentially do them uh, uh, tomorrow. But we're just looking to be as efficient as possible with our time, and so that's why we invited some other departments here uh, tonight to uh, have an opportunity to review their budget. Some of them were actually by the request uh, because they would have had difficulty uh, making a different time as well. And for those of you who are new to the process, what will happen tonight is that we will begin the budget review. Um, then we will take up amendments when we are complete with that budget review process. Um, and that's, there was a reference already made to one amendment. Amendments may come in throughout this process at different times. All of those amendments will be taken up after we have completely reviewed all of the budget. And it's only once we have reviewed and approved or denied those amendments that they we would then take up a motion to fully adopt the, the agenda tonight. Okay? Any questions about the process that we'll go through? Anyone? Okay. Well, then we will move right on down to our sole resolution, which is resolution number 078-102018. And that is to the adopt 2019 annual budget. I'll ask for a motion in a second, and that will bring the budget to the table. Is there a motion to adopt? There's a motion and a second. So that now brings it to the floor, and now we'll begin the budget review process. Uh, so I will call on, call on the county executive. Uh, there he is. All right. Uh, and 
what will happen tonight is the county executive will do an overview of the budget and then once he's completed the overview and you all have had an opportunity to speak uh, uh, and ask questions in regards to the overview then we'll be going to uh, the other departments so county executive yes and i wanted to start out just to add that the student government lunch is at a new location different from in prior years it's at 1332 spruce street and to get there from here you go uh, north on jackson left on New York, and then right on Spruce Street. And that address again is 1332 Spruce Street. So if you go to the location we've always held it in at the past, you'll miss lunch. But to give you an overview of the budget, um, just, just a very brief, you know, 100 foot level observation. Uh, this budget contains an equalized tax rate that's the lowest since 2000. And it's down 20 cents to $5.26, but that's on an equalized basis. Um, roughly two cents of that 20 cents comes from a reduction in our debt service. And the remaining uh, 18 cents uh, comes from a reduction in the operational rate. But, but remember, the equalized rate is based on market values. So this roughly will offset the increase that a typical homeowner would experience from uh, what's been about a 4% appreciation on average in their home. So this, this should hold most homeowners' taxes very close to even on existing homes. Uh, the amount of additional revenue that the county gets to work with uh, is the revenue that comes in from net new construction in the county. Um, uh, this budget has an unusual one-time item, and actually several of them, but. There was a large reduction in workers' compensation insurance throughout the departments, and that's because the reserve we create for that had become overfunded. So we're using that reserve to reduce workers' compensation insurance chargebacks to the departments. But you shouldn't consider that an annual recurring item, um, that this will bring the reserves more closely in line with where they should be, and it, it may, uh, the workers' compensation insurance may have to creep back up in future years. Um, this budget has a lot of reserves applied, and, and actually this is the third budget where we've applied significant reserves to the budget. Um, this one, it's over $5.5 .5 million. But our experience in the past has been that when we close the books, because we budget so conservatively, that we typically have not consumed the amount of reserves that we budget and apply uh, and, and for instance, in the past, we've applied reserves uh, to Parkview and to human services. And when we go to close the, the, the books, we actually have a net increase in our, our reserve counts. Um, and with that, I guess we'll move on to, uh, if there's no questions, we'll move on to, to departments. And I think agenda shows information systems and uh, I, I typically will cite people to the pages where the chart of personnel or the list of significant changes are. And for information services, if you go to page 178. As you can see- Executive Harris? Yes. I just want to make sure I see a couple questions. I want to make sure to see if they're on the overview. Uh, Supervisor Finch, you had a question. Was it on the overview? It was for the people back here. Okay. That I had five minutes ago. Okay. And then Supervisor Powers, did you have questions on the budget overview? Yes, okay. Mr. Chairman. Please um, go ahead then. I only want to say, uh, Mr. County Executive, that uh, going over the budget, I probably sent out about a dozen emails to department heads uh, questioning things that I had found that I was concerned about in, in their budget. And one of the department heads wrote me back that uh, he or she had presented all these things you know, to the proper people. I think that person was insulted that I was questioning this. And I just want the department heads to know, you know we're here to be the final say on these budgets. And I don't care how many people and how many departments they've shown this to. I'm asked to look at these as well, and um, was a little surprised by the 
the answer that I got that they already done all this with everybody and I'm not quite sure why, why I was asking a question, but that's what our job is as county supervisors. That's it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Supervisor Powers. Uh, and then we have one other question, Supervisor Eisen, uh, on the budget review. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Please. Well, this is almost a perennial uh, statement from myself. Uh, this concerns uh, page 60. On page 60, you list a table of organization change, listing a new environmental technician in the solid waste department. Yet on pages 12 looking at that organization chart. And I've repeatedly asked for the department to be added to the organization chart, and you can't appropriately identify it as a quasi-governmental uh, department or uh, board. That has been the custom of this board for decades, that uh, because the Solid Waste Department has a separate board and because uh, their costs are paid entirely by tipping fees and not by county levy, some prior executive decided to exclude them from the chart of the accounts. And if we add them back now, it will give the appearance of adding, you know, an additional, I think, what do you say, 18 employees? 16 employees. 16. Um, so we're just counting those employees consistent with the past. We can change that, but it's then going to give the appearance that we're having a significant increase in the number of employees. But you do acknowledge that you uh, have an additional employee. You know, they always have been employees of the county, but they've never shown up in the chart because they're not in the levy, and the budget book has largely been the levy. Now, we have added, and at your, your insistence years ago, we have added a tab for solid waste in the budget book. Thank you. I, I have uh, two other uh, requests, uh, and uh, one is... Uh, would you be able to give the board an accounting of the status of the remodeling security windows and tunnel at this courthouse? I think that would be better directed to uh, Mike Elder when, uh, when his section of the budget comes up. I mean, I, I could tell you a little bit, but might not be able to get the detail you want. That's fine. It's on the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Eisen. Seeing no other questions or comments in regards to the overview, we'll, we'll go ahead and move to information systems. Oh, I apologize. Eh? We do have one more. Supervisor Singh Stock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Harris, I'm referring to page 10, okay. the last sentence under the conclusion. Continued pressure in the form of levy limits will inevitably force the county to seek alternate re revenues <clears throat> or abandon some services valued by this community. Can you give me some examples of what we're trying to do to make sure that down the road we don't get in a situation where we may have to lay people off or cut services? Well, again, it has to do with how the levy limits work. We basically have to cut our tax rate to offset appreciation of property. We only get increased revenue from net new construction. Um, the county's population is relatively flat, uh, less than 500 additional residents per year on average. And uh, the, the millennial generation 
um, is paying for more of their own education than prior generations did. And so they're slower at family formation, uh, probably gonna have smaller families and are uh, slightly more likely to, to rent rather than own compared to prior generations. So all of those factors would suggest that net new construction in the county is gonna be relatively slow. Um, this year, I think it was just over 1.4%, 1.43, I think. And if we're limited to total growth significantly below the rate of inflation, that, that is gonna put pressure on us. And then just looking long term, you could anticipate that we would either have to have additional revenues or reduce some form of spending, which in our case is almost inevitably services. So that's, I'm just, I'm putting that warning out there that uh, we've gotten by for a long time on efficiencies, combining two nursing home buildings into one and, and having a reduction of staff there, closing the Huber facility and putting prisoners out on electronic bracelets, um, switching to family care, which saved us about $4 million that was phased in over a four year period. All those type of things gave us significant savings, which have allowed us to live within that tight budget environment. But at some point in time, one can anticipate that either the cost of health care or, <clears throat> or wages will start to exceed the amount of allowable new levy we can have. And in that case, we either have to find some new efficiency, find some service to decrease, or would have to adopt additional revenues. Um, you're seeing some counties going out for a wheel tax. We're not asking for that in this budget. Um, most counties have now adopted a county sales tax. I believe there's only four counties at a 5.0% sales tax rate. Um, there's a, two counties, I think, at a 5.1 rate, and everybody else is at 5.5% or higher, and that's because uh, you might have a 0.1% stadium tax. The county sales tax is either zero or 0.5%. And there's just a few counties that haven't adopted that. That would be another area that someday we could increase revenue if we chose to do so. This budget is not asking for that either. But I'm just trying to put the board on notice. That if I look long term into the future, without other changes, uh, and with uh, pressure on the amount of revenues we receive from the state, that at some point something will have to change. And, and then that's a tough decision the board will have to make. Thank you, Supervisor Singstock. Seeing no other questions or comments in regards to the budget overview, we'll move on to information systems. Their chart of personnel is on page 178. As you can see, they've gone from 17 to 18 full-time people. And uh, the additional person was the addition of a cybersecurity architect position. And uh, quite frankly, this is necessary in government today because of the amount of hacking and the uh, cyber attacks that governments are now under. There's a summary of the significant changes on page 180. And you can see that the tax levy for this department is, is shifting from 1,739,000 to 1,884,000. Any questions or comments in regards to the information systems budget? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and move on to the next department. Next department is district attorney. Uh, the district attorney uh, charter personnel is on page 209. That is actually decreasing from 18 full-time to 17 full-time employees. Um, the list of significant changes is on page 210 and their levy is going from 1,168,000 to 1,190,000.
Any questions and comments in regards to the district attorney's budget? I'll call on Supervisor Singstock. No, I, I didn't put nope. that. No. And I'll call next on Supervisor Fari. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is for the district attorney. Uh, at our last legislative committee meeting, I believe we had one or perhaps it was two counties that were, were requesting additional funding for uh, the district attorney's office. Specifically, they want more attorneys to prosecute cases. Uh, I'm interested to see we're reducing up by one. Could I have an explanation for that reduction, please? Yes. Um, so the reduction is for an investigator in our office. And what happened primarily with this is, I think as uh, most people on the board know, we're uh, in Winnebago County, we're, we're not only a state leader, but we're a national leader on alternative and diversion programming. And we have a very sophisticated system in place uh, that we've actually presented in different states about. And one of the key components of our uh, system is identifying the, uh, I guess, defendant's risk to reoffend as well as what their criminogenic needs are so that we can uh, focus whatever intervention strategies on those particular needs, whether it's mental health, AODA, employment, work skills. <clears throat> um, and we have a risk needs assessment individual who does that for us. And that position has been funded in part by a grant from the Department of Justice. And the Department of Justice has now implemented a system for alternative and diversion programs. Um, we actually put ours in place about five years ago. Um, and it did not appear to be worthwhile for us to go back five years to utilize the Attorney General's system. So we're sticking with the system that we've been designing in Winnebago County and, and uh, writing for the last five years in part because we're able to do studies out of it now. But by losing that grant money, we had to bring that risk needs assessor on, well, they were already in our table of organization, but we had to fund that position. And the only place we could find to uh, try to do that was by eliminating an investigator position. We had a retirement, so we didn't displace anybody. And we used those funds to cover that other position. So we went from three investigators to two. Is it feasible for your model to be a state model? Has that been introduced uh, through your attorney's process or however you guys do that? Um, uh, and we got counties asking for more DAs. I, I assume then they might want to look at your model and maybe that increase could be offset. Uh, you know, I would certainly hope so, and we have presented at the state uh, level on what we do in Winnebago County and how we manage things. Um, and, and so far, you know, I, I think we're doing okay. You know, we don't charge everything that law enforcement always wants charged, but um, since I believe 2009 or 2010, we've had the highest felony conviction rate in the state of Wisconsin. Our backlog is measured, you know, by tens of cases, not thousands of cases. So our backlog right now today is about 50 some odd cases. And I know there was a news article last year talking about similar size DA's office being backlogged thousands of cases and, and years worth of work. So I think we're doing okay. If this doesn't work, next year I'll let you know I need another position. <laughs> You but don't, want, do my you don't best. want him added in this year, then. Is that what you're telling me? I, 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 think, I think we're going to be OK. okay. And we're, we're going to give this a shot. We think Thank we you. can do it. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Fari. Next uh, speaker is Supervisor Eisen. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my reference uh, for the district attorney is on the budget page 210. Uh, there is a uh, reference in the item uh, for Wisconsin retirement uh, that there were uh, increase due to wage study pay increases and the new investigator enrolling in the Wisconsin <coughs> retirement program. In 2018, two investigators were in the department and they did not participate in the Wisconsin retirement program. How can you be an employee of the uh, county and not be in the retirement system unless these guys were already retired from the system? And that's exactly what it was. This predates the law change. 
Um, so the individuals that we had that were in our office before were able to remain in their retirement status and be employed by our office so they didn't collect additional benefits. But then when we had the retirement and had to hire a new investigator, they weren't allowed to collect their benefits, so we had to add the benefits. And they didn't have to pay in either. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the other question I have for uh, the district attorney is on page 216. In this case, uh, there's a capital uh, request for a 2019 G Grand Cherokee at $30,188. Uh, is there something particular about that car? I think you could probably get a Dodge minivan for about $10,000 less. There's not anything in particular about that car. I think law enforcement just gets a list of vehicles that are available at the state prices. Um, and that was the one that they decided on. I'm not sure, I, I w guess I wasn't specifically involved in the discussions. The vehicles that we have, we keep for a very long time, as I think the county board knows, um, because they don't get subjected to the high speeds and, and things that law enforcement will sometimes have to subject them to, uh, but we keep them for a pretty long time. And I think this has been something that we knew was coming, uh, but as far as the specific vehicle, I don't know. I, I don't know if they looked at where they have to go. They do. So if we need ten thousand dollars in the budget, we can we can get you a minivan. Not me. I drive a BMW. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> thank you, Supervisor Rice. Next uh, speaker is Supervisor Binder. I guess my curiosity would be if. They can't post bond in the jail, then they have to stay till they get to court. Are you going to be basically efficient? And our jail population right now is, is getting larger, and we're thinking of basically adding on to the jail. So if our efficiency goes down and they can't get to court on Monday or Tuesday, that's just another one or two days that we have to keep them in the system. So I just would like to make sure that you're not going to get backlogged and we end up having our jail population where we're sending them out to another county when basically we need another district attorney. Yeah, thank you for that. And in the position, so the, the prosecutors in the office are state funded. Um, and so we're not eliminating any of them. Um, and I really appreciate um, being conscientious about that. And we are, in fact, uh, about a year ago, we did our own study of how cases were getting to the jail. And right now, from the time a case is referred to our, or a, a person is taken into custody until we get them out of the jail is between 1.81 and 2.0 two days. Um, so we're getting them very quickly. Uh, what I can't overcome are holidays and weekends um, because there's not an ability to get them into court, things of that sort. So, um, but otherwise, we're doing pretty well on that one. And I know the jail population is coming up. We have formed um, a jail reduction work group. We're working with several community partners, um, county agency partners, um, and we're working on strategies to try to address that jail population. Um, and, and I believe what, I, what I've heard at least is that the jail population was about 340 back in 2006. So we've, we've kept it under about 300 for a long time. It's crept up to, as you indicated, about 330. Um, I think we've done as much as we can just in the DA's office alone with programming to try to keep that population under control. And what we've seen is that a third of that population is probation holds, people on extended supervision holds, things of that sort. Um, about a third is pretrial and about a third is sentencing. So we've pulled together all the players that can help us address each of those components and we've asked them to help us try to reduce that jail population. Um, and I think at our last Safe Streets meeting, um, uh, the sheriff had indicated that we're about 140 people average daily population lower than out of Gamey County. Um, and, and that number uh, really struck me because when I calculated that out, that's over $3 million a year less that we're paying in Winnebago County because of how we manage our population and deal with things. Um, so I, I certainly appreciate you being cognizant of what we're trying to do. And, and believe me, I'll be back if, if we need help. And we're trying to find new strategies so that we don't have to go that route. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Supervisor Bender. Next speaker is Vice Chairman Egan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question pretty much goes right along with what um, Supervisor Eisen had to say. I was just quite surprised that we were getting Jeep uh, Cherokees for our DA's office. I just don't think that that should be 
even thought of. I think it should be more like a vehicle or something like that. It's uh, $30,000 for a few Cherokees for our DAs to run around and I just, I, I don't know, I was quite surprised to see that in your budget, Mr. Bassett. Yeah, and just to clarify, that's not, the DAs don't use that. I don't use that and none of the prosecutors use that. That's used by a police officer. So why is it in your budget, if I may ask? Uh, we employ two investigators. Yes, uh, I'm sorry, you had indicated for prosecutor, for DAs running around. The prosecutors don't drive it, it it's a police vehicle. So if you said two of them drive it, what does the other one drive? Uh, we're not replacing the other vehicle yet. Um, it's a, uh, I don't know what it is. It's a car, no problem. Yeah, it's a car of some sort. Okay, thank you. Certainly, thank you. Thank you, Vice Chairman Egan. Seeing no other speakers or questions or comments, that completes the DA's budget. So we'll, thank you. Thank you. So we'll move on down to the next budget, which is the Clerk of Courts. The chart of personnel for the Clerk of Courts is on page 222. They will have 42 full-time and two part-time employees. That's a net decrease of one full-time employee. Uh, their levy is going from two million three hundred and twenty eight thousand to two million two hundred and fifty nine thousand a significant decrease any questions or comments in regards to the clerk of courts budget seeing none we'll go ahead and move to the next budget which would be the emergency management The chart of personnel for emergency management is on page 265. They're budgeted for two full-time and one part-time employee, the same as last year. Last year's levy was $197,137. There's a slight increase to $199,809. Questions and comments in regards to the emergency management budget? I'll call on Supervisor Eisen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'd like to call on the uh, Director of Emergency Management uh, for those uh, supervisors that are not aware. Uh, I chair the Emergency Management Committee and uh, uh, was helpful with the the director when she went to her budget meetings. And one of the, one of the uh, concerns uh, that we have is the aging of our command vehicle. And uh, while we're not asking anything in the budget today, I think I'll allow uh, or I'll ask for uh, Linda to uh, address the board on the need and the uh, parameters of the expenses that are on the horizon. Good evening, everyone. I wasn't expecting that, so I'm not going to be very prepared, sorry. Um, but it is something that we are reviewing. We have the highway department work on our command post, and we have been told that the age of the, com the command post, uh, difficulty in getting replacement parts, um, it's, it's looking at it's about 24 years old and it might be time to start looking at replacing it. We have talked to a, a vendor, got some drawings. We are definitely not impressed with the price. Um, so we are looking to the future, possibly a capital improvement project in the next couple years or so. Um, but this vehicle is an important part of emergency response. Um, it is used for the Trestle Trail incident recently. The Department of Criminal Investigations needed it on scene to interview some of the witnesses um, to protect some of the people who were there away from media. Our Sheriff's Department uses it when they do SWAT calls. Our negotiators are there with them when they are on scene um, so that they can negotiate with anybody who is holding someone hostage. Um, it is an important part of emergency response for some of our most 
drastic and difficult uh, law enforcement situations. So again, today I'm not asking for the money. I'm glad that you are aware that it is going to be coming up in the future years. We will be working with hopefully some of our local foundations in Oshkosh um, and the Fox Valley Foundation for our Nina Menasha area so we can secure some donations. It's a big ticket item. I'm, I'm just gonna be honest with you but it is something that is very necessary. And we have a pretty good committee put together with all the responder agencies, including Oshkosh Fire, um, our Sheriff's Office, Information Systems, our Highway Department. Um, we're getting some really valuable input and we will come back with a price um, down the road and a piece of equipment that will meet the needs of our county. Thank you. That's probably between 200 and $800,000. Thank you, Supervisor Eisen. That's not far off. <laughs> Next speaker is Supervisor Powers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And, and Linda, I'm sorry if, if you did answer this totally with the, with the email that I sent you, um, but Spectrum was having outages and I was having a horrible time with my email today. Um, one of the questions I ask is if you're, work, if you're coordinating with the Red Cross, the American Red Cross, in preparedness, planning, and training. Did you ask, answer that one, whether those three things you're working with with the Red Cross? I'm sorry, I did answer your email. Did you say you received it? I didn't. I did receive it, but I wasn't sure that I, that I caught that those specific things were, were addressed. Preparedness, planning, and training. And then again, Spectrum went crashing, and so I had almost no email all day long. Not a problem. We do train with them. We, um, we attend trainings with them, and we invite them to our trainings. We also do disaster exercises with them, and we work on preparedness campaigns together. Okay. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Supervisor Powers. Next speaker is Supervisor Finch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my questions have just been answered. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, Supervisor Finch. Next speaker is Supervisor Konetsky. Linda, did I miss it? Or how old is the equipment you have now? I'm sorry, I didn't understand. How old? How, how old is your current equipment? Our that, command post? Yeah. Yes. Approximately 24 years old. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Konetsky. Seeing no other comments or speakers, that'll complete the emergency management. Thank, thank you. you. We'll move on to the next budget, and that is the public health budget. The Charter Personnel and Public Health is on page 315. Um, the public health will remain at 36 full time and nine part time employees. The levy is changing from 1,867,000 to 1,970,000, an increase of about 102,000. Any questions or comments in regards to the public health budget? I'll call on Supervisor Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Guerin, this question for Mr. Guerin. Uh, could you share with the board the experience of uh, the consolidating of the Nina Oshkosh uh, and the uh, uh, other municipalities in, in a uh, total group, uh, and also uh, the arrangement uh, working out at the Otter Street uh, Administration Building, which is the new location for uh, delivering public services. Good evening. Um, just sort of quickly recap. Uh, the County Health Department, the City of Oshkosh Health Department, and the Nina Health Department consolidated in 2012. Um, and so we've been under a, you know, under a combined scenario for several years now. Um, we moved from the lower level of the old Parkview to uh, the County Administration Building uh, about a year prior to consolidation. Uh, I had planned for uh, some space there in case that happened. Um, that consolidation has worked out quite well. Um, uh, we've, uh, you know, we realized immediate savings. Uh, we were able to um, uh, refund the uh, prior uh, reserve account to the towns. Uh, over a million dollars went back to the towns after the consolidation. Uh, a new um, reserve budget was established at that point in time. Um, that is, uh, is currently fairly well funded. Um, and I think, um, you know, by all, you know, all measures that we've, that we have, we feel that that's been a, a really successful uh, combination of, of services. Uh, it's, it's offered us uh, greater uh, expertise and capacity 
in, in our programming areas, uh, and we're also to, uh, able to uh, pull more resources together uh, as a combined agency, apply for uh, more funding sources, and, um, and have more staff available for response to you know, crises like outbreaks. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Eisen. Seeing no other speakers or comments in regards, oh, we have one more. Supervisor Dufferty. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, just a quick question. I noticed that uh, um, I see that there's an increase of $127,000, um, and this is on page 316, uh, increase based on actual grant con contracted services. Um, could you uh, uh, give me some examples of what kind of contracted services, you know, entailed that $127,000 increase? Uh, yes, the, um, the health department acts as a, uh, as a fiscal agent uh, to help uh, some of the work in the community occur. Um, our, our largest example of that is that we're the fiscal agent for the, um, the HERC, the Hospital Emergency Readiness Coalition, and that's a, a regional coalition of hospitals, public health, um, emergency management, EMS, uh, and they receive uh, significant funding from uh, the state, which we administer as our fiscal agent. So changes in that grant, um, you know, which have been around, you know, $300,000 a year just for that grant alone, um, have uh, resulted in, all, in a, a, a big increase in the past in the contracting of services to have, um, have the work of that grant occur. And other grants that we receive um, for opiates, um, uh, for uh, the Regional Trauma Advisory Council, those all end up, um, many of those funds end up being spent um, uh, for contracted services. And so that's an area that has grown, and, but it also fluctuates quite a bit depending on what grant revenues we're receiving and, um, and, and what the source of those revenues are. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Daffney. Seeing, oops, Supervisor Norton. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I'm, I'm vice chair of the health board, and Doug is here now and may not be tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon when we vote on amendments, the health um, board will be bringing forth two minor amendments, and Doug, if you want to comment, you can, but one is to increase one public health nurse from a 0 0.8 full-time position, full-time equivalent to a full-time position. Um, there's no going to be any added money asked because there's a $20,000 temporary employee um, line item to, co to cover this cost, so there will be no extra money for that. And also another minor amendment um, is a, a convert a health educator project employee to a regular part-time employee because um, there's a policy that um, to convert to a regular employee status, it has the place to be stay on. And the budget already includes this position in its cost-neutral adjustment to the table of organization. So I just wanted to make that um, point out to the to the board, and if people have any questions about those two relatively minor amendments, they can ask Doug at this time. Thank you, Supervisor Norton. Seeing no other questions or comments, that'll conclude public health. Thank you, Director Bean. Thank you. Moving on then to the next budget, which is Veterans Services. The chart of personnel for Veterans Services is on page 339. Uh, veteran Services is increasing one full-time employee to eight. Their levy is increasing from 577000 to 644000 Any questions or comments in regards to the Veteran Services budget? Any questions or comments regarding the Veteran Services budget? Supervisor Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to draw the uh, board's attention to page 336 in 2018 accomplishments. You read down under number one. You'll read total office investment from 2015 to 2017 was $1,334,882.
a return on investment of 338,990%. Keep, keep that in your mind, guys. This uh, veteran service office is doing big stuff, and we're coming for, Mark is giving us uh, one additional benefit specialist with another to be added next year. Uh, it's my intention to amend that to come on as soon as we can get them. It'd be an additional expenditure of about $20,000 from what I believe, but uh, we, we can pay for that. We probably spent 20 grand on staples. So uh, <laughs> uh, just keep that in mind, the return on investment for adding a benefit specialist and having these people do their work is phenomenal. Thank you. Uh, yeah, I, I don't spend 20000 on staples, but I do want to I want to reinforce those comments. One of the reasons why we're willing to add staff to the Veterans Service Office is because with their staff, they're helping to connect veterans to benefits to which they're entitled that they might not otherwise get. And they're on schedule to bring in $65 million of federal benefits to Winnebago County veterans. Uh, an additional 27,000 in state benefits and 32,000 of emergency relief provided by the county. So there is a significant return of cash flow into the county as a result of having a large and active veteran service office. If I may comment, then we need to add the 48 million in home loans that we do too. We don't forget that. So. So it, it's a unique office. We're able to have an economic impact because the better we do our jobs, the more benefits we execute, uh, brings money into veterans' pockets, federal money, and they come out and they spend that in the community with purchases of goods and services and, and uh, property tax payments. We've had veterans behind on their property tax, and we've gotten federal money, and they've paid the tax, so it comes into your budget. So our budget, I should say. So it's, it's a real benefit. Uh. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, being my age, I've had the opportunity of watching and knowing what the veterans have done for us. And any time that veterans need something, it's because they truly need it. So I am hoping that when this comes up, we give them 100% backing because They've gave themselves 100% for us. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Finch. I actually have one other comment uh, or question. Supervisor Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I don't know if you're the proper person to ask this, but there's been talk, and I think App or Outer Gaming has a veterans court. Um, do you think we need a veterans court in Winneville County? And could you explain any more information you have on a veterans court? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, that's a good question. Um, when uh, Christian was here, we, we're, we're working the Diversion Veterans Program, and uh, it's working real well. We, we contact veterans, and we've helped uh, several veterans get their benefits and get them into the VA healthcare system. So um, the, the cost and the, the, the manpower behind those courts is pretty intensive, and if, if we have to transfer to a different court, we, have, we can do that, if that would help that veteran, uh, to out of gamey or uh, there's other courts. So. Uh, the Veterans Diversion Program is what we're utilizing right now, and, uh, and we've had some real good success with that. Thank you, Supervisor Norton. Sorry. Seeing no other call-ins, that will conclude the Veterans Services Budget. Thank you, Mr. Wallach. Thank you. So we will move on to the next budget, which is the County Executive's Budget. Uh, the County Executive's Charge of Personnel is on page 82. Uh, it will remain two full-time employees, which includes the county executive. Uh, the levy is moving from 238,000 to 243,000, and there's really no significant changes in that budget. Any questions or comments in regards to the county executive's budget? Seeing none, we will go ahead and move on next to the corporation council's budget. I apologize, Supervisor Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Harris, uh, perhaps I should have uh, this at the uh, 
overview, uh, but uh, I'd like to uh, share with you and the finance director and the board that in preparing for the budget, I've reviewed the uh, Winnebago County Comprehensive Annual Financial Report mm -hmm. uh, that was published in 2017. The CAFR is management's representations concerning the finances of the county. And by state law, it must be published within seven months of the close of the fiscal year. Our 2017 CAFR was published in July of 2018. I would like to ask uh, the county executive and the finance director if they can reconcile the justifications for the 2019 budget with the CAFR's explanation, pages 29 to 32, that in 2017, there was $4,914,482 over budgeted. Basically, and, uh, and, and uh, that's broken down to about $1.2 million for general government, $1.6 million for public safety, 340000 for public works, 371,000 for health and human services, 936,000 for culture, education, recreation, and 438,000 for conservation and development. That in addition, the Human Services Fund had a surplus of $3,600,000 for 2017. And I have a suspicion that 2018 is going to be the same thing, because it was for 2016 and 15. Basically, the, the primary source of reserves being left over at the end of budgets, which are then closed out to our general reserve account, is because we budget conservatively. We budget on the presumption that all of the budgeted positions will be full the entire year. Um, you always have some turnover, and to the extent that you have a position that remains vacant for a time, typically there's savings. Now, we have started to build in adjustments to those departments that chronically have unfilled positions, but we really only budget the staffing level that we think they should have, and we, like I say, we generally put that in as if all those positions were full for the entire year. But one of the reasons this budget had such a, uh, a tiny change in levy had to do with uh, making an adjustment of about $600,000 in Parkview, where it's almost impossible to stay fully staffed. So we know that the actual payroll will come in below what otherwise would be the budgeted payroll, and we make an adjustment for that. Uh, in some other departments, you can't do that. Uh, in the sheriff's uh, office, you typically have some vacancies as well, some turnover, but uh, that often results in offsetting overtime costs. So we looked at the individual departments and, and determined where we could make an adjustment. Now, what that also means, though, is that we, when we close out the year, you're not going to have the same type of amounts closing out to those surplus funds. And uh, Parkview surplus is, is built up to quite an extent, and that's why we're applying a significant portion of their surplus back to their operations. Uh, I, I think that an does that answer your question? Well, it pretty, it's pretty much on target. Uh, but uh, one question uh, that I might uh, pursue, or perhaps I'll leave it till uh, the relevant department uh, presents, and then I can uh, uh, revisit the issue uh, at that time. Thank you. Yeah, let, let me add one more comment because it, it, it's relevant. We typically talk about the general fund, which is where department surpluses that are not a separate enterprise close out to. And even though we've been applying when we do our budgeting reserves 
from the general fund to, to the budget, the balance in that account when we close out has typically continued to increase. And you specifically referenced a significant surplus in human services. Well, um, that came from a couple different sources. One source was they detected, and that may have been actually this calendar year, they detected an error in a prior reimbursement that the state gave, which was a significant change. And then in some of our departments, the money comes out of a state pool and the pool is spread pro rata over the, uh, relative to the expenses made, maybe in a human service department or in the nursing home. And uh, in the case of Parkview, there actually was less nursing home beds statewide than in the past. And so when they spread those monies, it ended up being a higher reimbursement per bed to Parkview. And you had similar allocations of programs in the human service area uh, and they were basically spreading the monies over a smaller population so the reimbursement per person comes out higher. But you don't actually find out those amounts often until after the end of the calendar year. So it's almost impossible to budget those in advance. You just have to wait until the, the state notifies you of what's, what's coming in the closing numbers. Thank you, Supervisor Eisen. Seeing no other speakers, we'll once again, we'll move on down to the Corporation Council's budget. The chart of personnel for Corporate Council is on page 90. Um, there's, there continues to be four full-time employees in 2019, the same as in 2018. And the uh, chart of significant changes is on page 91. Their budget is moving from 516,000 to 521,000. Any questions or comments in regards to the Corporation Council budget? Okay, seeing none, we will go ahead and move on to the next one, which is the Human Resources and Payroll Budgets. The Chart of Personnel for Human Resources is on page 128. Uh, they have, they're budgeted for eight full-time and two part-time employees, the same as last year. Uh, they're Significant changes are shown on page 129. Questions, comments in regards to the human resources budget? Supervisor Eisen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Collier. Because health insurance is so costly an expense item, I would respectfully request that the insurance renewal be presented to the county board for our review, advice, and consent. For years, we have always received presentations of health insurance renewals. And for years, we've had input uh, in that uh, decision process. And it's not too late to address that uh, to the board, hopefully uh, in this budget session, uh, if that renewal information has been received. So I'll just generally present that as a uh, observation of uh, a supervisor who's probably in the uh, older half of the class. Dr. Collard, any comments? Well, sure. I, I'd certainly be, get, be glad to, uh, to talk about health insurance and answer any questions. Uh, Supervisor Eisen or the board may have, but I can give just an overview of our process. We do have a self-funded health insurance plan, uh, and uh, so we don't uh, we don't go out for renewal in the sense of getting a insurance company to give us quotes for a premium. We talk with our consultant uh, about that process every year. Uh, the consultant, by the way. Uh, 
does represent a lot of different governmental entities and is very aware of the market and what kind of uh, options are available in the health insurance marketplace for similar organizations. Uh, so it's a process uh, that we spend quite a bit of time on discussing uh, how the plan is looking, what changes might need to be made. There are some portions of it that are contracted out, of course. We do, for instance, have a, it's called a third-party administrator, uh, which is the company that actually processes our claims. We don't do that ourselves and, and pay the doctors directly ourselves. We hire a company called UMR uh, to do that for us. The contract with UMR is arranged through the Wisconsin Counties Association Group Health Trust. Uh, they have uh, very favorable rates from UMR available for providing this kind of service, which the Group Health Trust also uses for those counties which it directly insures, which it does for uh, a dozen or so counties plus a group of cities and a group of school districts. Uh, so we get very favorable rates that way. Another part of it that does come up for renewal is the uh, uh, excess insurance. If we have very large claims, you know, over currently we're looking at $300,000 as our self-insured retention per claim per year. Uh, we do have claimants that go over that amount every year, uh, usually between two and five. Occasionally it's even been higher than that that go over uh, the $300,000 level in one year. And we look at those very carefully and we do have our consultant shop uh, and get renewal quotes for the self-insured, for the excess risk insurance on the um, very large claims. Uh, those rates came in just uh, a couple of weeks ago actually and, and looking pretty favorable uh, in terms of being an increase but less, a little less than we had expected or included in our budgeted projections. We also look monthly at the amount of claims because that's where the big dollars are, that's where the majority of the expense is. The amount of actual claims uh, from all our employees and dependents we have, I believe it's over 2,300 lives insured in our program. Uh, for health and uh, so that's a lot of people going to a lot of different health care providers uh, and we look at not claim by claim information of course but uh, aggregate data showing how we're doing month to month. Uh, the last several months actually have been quite favorable. Uh, they do fluctuate uh, more than one would expect uh, for the size of, of group that we have. It fluctuates quite, quite a bit from month to month and from year to year. Uh, we base our internal premiums primarily on, on where we project you know, the stop loss, ex, ex, excess risk insurance to come in, and the uh, administrative expenses, uh, but primarily on a projection forward of our actual claims dollars. They do a two-year weighted look-back period to project forward what we think the claims dollars will be. Uh, so for this year, uh, we look, we, and we also look at possible plan design changes and things maybe we could be doing differently or things we might be able to do to save some money and look at where we are compared to other, other counties, other cities, other employers, uh, at where we are in the marketplace. So we have, uh, you know, half a dozen or more meetings about that internally every year and, and look very carefully at, at those dollars. Uh, so for 2019, we're projecting or planning to make a, uh, relatively modest change in the deductible amounts. We still have much lower deductibles than an average plan of our size. Uh, you often hear about people, the only insurance they can have available through work is $3,000 deductible or 2,500 or up and up. And that's really been going up and we've been trying to keep that low. Uh, it's currently $500 per person seven, or, uh, and 1000 per family. We're projecting to raise that next year, but only to $750 a person, 1500 per family. So that's a very modest change uh, and uh, still keeps us very favorably positioned for employees to get a good benefit. Uh, with that modest change in the deductibles and some good results we've had recently, uh, we're looking at uh, a 2.1% increase in the health insurance expenses, total expenses for the year, or the premiums I should say, are what we call the internal premiums. They're not strictly speaking in uh, premiums, but they're chargebacks to departments and to employees. Uh, but we treat it as an internal premium. Uh, so for that to go up only 2.1%, I mean, I know counties that are looking at 15, 20% increases. So, so that's very good, especially since you consider the fact that we've only been self-insured for a little under two years now. And so there was a lot of uncertainty. And we took some risks and, and some gamble in the sense of uh, 
kind of setting the, the premiums, our internal premiums for the last two years a little bit lower than they probably should have been set. And we felt comfortable doing that because we still had retained a substantial uh, fund balance from our previous self-insured fund. Uh, it was about two and a half million dollars. Uh, we expected to use a good bit of that this year and a good bit last year. That hasn't actually turned out to uh, have been the case. We've used relatively little of it um, going to the self-insured. Uh, and with the rates we're setting for next year, we do project a break even on, on the health insurance. Uh, in other words, we're projecting at what we think will break even and not require additional uses of fund balance uh, as opposed to intentionally under budgeting and expecting to use some fund balance like we have the last two years. And, and we have used some fund balance, or will use some fund balance by the end of the year. Uh, so that's where we are. Um, we've uh, obviously been, been trying to educate employees, uh, save money where we can on, on health costs. A uh, big part of that, of course, has been the three waves, health, and, health clinic and wellness center, which is a joint effort between the county City of Oshkosh and the uh, Oshkosh Area School District, and uh, we directly fund our share of that clinic. Our participation in the clinic has been proportionally better than either the city or the school district, so we've been paying a little bit more of our share. We started out paying 30% of the costs. Uh, now it's more like 38% of the cost, but that just indicates we've been more successful in getting our employees and benefits to the clinic, introducing them to the, to the great service provided there. And uh, there's no question in my mind that saves a significant amount of money. Uh, you may want to know how much it saves. I can't really tell you because I think most of the savings are things that we cannot accurately measure directly. Uh, in terms of you know, what other kind of medical costs would those people have incurred if they had gone out in the medical uh, industry elsewhere and received their medical services. We have done surveys showing that something like 30% of the people that go to the clinic would have gone to urgent care or even occasionally uh, the emergency room situation if they hadn't had the clinic available and of course those costs would have been quite a bit higher. But even just assuming that people would have gone to a normal uh, doctor or other health care provider at one of the, the main, uh, well, what we do is we take the, the type of visits and the type of uh, things people are seen for at the clinic and apply those numbers to the average cost we have for the same kind of services in our plan out in, in the medical community. And even on that basis, we're saving uh, some money uh, after paying for all our expenses and uh, after accounting for the fact that employees do not have to pay any deductibles or co-pays if they go to the clinic. So that provides employees with uh, a good benefit and we can demonstrate that we're not only breaking even but coming out a little head even on that basis. But just by providing better service, uh, better steerage, and better selection of uh, specialty care is huge. And providing people with, with someone to help guide them through the healthcare system uh, so they don't go and see unnecessary specialists, they're seeing the right specialist when they need it, for instance. That alone is, I think, in my mind, probably the biggest savings, and I have no way to accurately measure it. I, I could you know, make something up, but I, I wouldn't trust it. <laughs> but I'm sure it's there. So, so we feel very good about what we're doing on, on health care and health insurance. Uh, we do have a consultant, works with us, uh, does a great job, and uh, I know he's been to the board several times over the past five years to give presentations, and I'm sure we could arrange for him to do that again if, if the board wishes. Thank you, Supervisor Eisen. Thank you, Director Collard. Next speaker is uh, Supervisor Shorsey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my uh, comment was similar on a similar vein, and in terms of the amount of employee contributions to their health plan, and not only looking at other counties, but looking at the local private marketplace, I think is very important, and I noted in um, the report that we are having some migration of um, you know people going from single coverage to family coverage and um, it probably because this is a much better plan so I do think that um, especially as we look at the financial situation of the county that we we do need to uh, get employees al aligned um, as you've done with the great um, survey of, of wages, et cetera. I think that needs to continue to go down 
um, the line in terms of other benefits, including the health plan. Thank you, Supervisor Shorsey. Next speaker, Supervisor Singstock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I would like to request your permission to let back up a little bit. I'd like to add on to some of the comments that Mr. Harris made in response to Supervisor Paul over there. Is how about it, the surplus? Okay, so how about we do this? How about we finish up with human resources and then okay. between that budget and the next one, we'll, we'll, we'll give you an update. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions in regards to human resources? Supervisor Norton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mike, a couple of months ago, I emailed you about if we were looking at um, possibly changing what I think is an outdated and ludicrous vacation policy, Whereas, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, if an employee starts in August or Oct October, they don't, they don't get, a, they have to wait almost over a year to get a, the full um, time of vacation that's entitled to them. And you said you were looking at that, and that's good. My question is, when are you going to bring that revised vacation plan to this board? We have been looking at it, and uh, by we, I'm, I'm not just talking about myself and HR staff, but we formed a, a informal working group of department heads that have had, uh, I'm gonna say four or five meetings to, to discuss uh, the issue of vacation, sick time, and, and other time off policies. And uh, the group has more or less been, been working toward a consensus uh, and I think we're fairly close to uh, at least having a draft of a uh, proposed policy, uh, which would, uh, the way it currently looks, uh, would be a combined uh, PTO or paid time off plan combining uh, vacation and uh, sick leave as well as floating holidays, which have been an issue. And they would make that benefit significantly more consistent across employee groups. Now, we don't have a finished product yet. And you know the issue of a timeline has come up with the group, and our, my response has been, uh, and our, our working rule has been that I will bring a plan forward first to the county executive and then to the personnel and finance committee. But I but I won't bring it any further until our group has a clear consensus on, on what we want to propose. So we're not trying to, you know, I thought about trying to get something together to propose it to county board and be resolved by the end of the year. Um, we could have done that, but it wouldn't have been as comfortable and, and involved and involving a process as I would like to have because uh, these policies can be very difficult to implement. Uh, it can be very difficult to gain widespread acceptance among, among employees of changes in these kind of benefits. And so I think it's uh, prudent to, pursue, to uh, proceed more cautiously and make sure that we really have buy-in and involvement from all the appropriate stakeholders before, before we proceed. So I don't have a date in mind that, that I can promise to bring it to the board, uh, but I can promise that we will continue to make progress on this and, and work actively on it uh, with our working group until we have something that we can present. So my question would be, okay, we're not going to have it in, in place for 2019, and if this working group can't get a consensus until spring of 2019, this won't be in effect in two, until 2020. Am I correct on that? Uh, what we've discussed with the work group is that it could be implemented for new employees whenever the board adopts it, and that existing employees, there will have to be some form of uh, transition period built into the plan. And my final statement is, is the reason I'm kind of pushing it is because I think, like I said, I think it's kind of an outdated vacation or time off plan. And I think it, it kind of would hinder us in trying to attract employees for open positions, especially if they're in an age 25 to 40. And um, that's why I'm glad you, what you said last about it could apply to new employees. But I guess I would like to see this brought to the forth and let us discuss this as soon as possible. Thank you for your response. Thank you, Supervisor Norton. Next speaker is Supervisor Binder. What will a share be worth this year on the pay scale? I don't know. Uh, we, we have a formula that determines that, but it depends on where the evaluations come in and how they're applied to each individual employee line by line. So I'll be able to tell you that in about three weeks. 
Is there a way of taking the step increases out of the wage increase? I mean, years ago when I worked for the highway department, we worked 18 months, we got a review and we got a step raise or the, the supervisor said that you, you needed to improve on this. You know, the way it's set up right now, if you happen to come out between a 11 and 17, if you're a new employee that's, that's worked for the county, you could have started in September and you're gonna get five shares and I could have worked for the county for 20 years, I'm gonna get two shares. And I realize my step raise is built in there but it doesn't seem like I'm competing on the same level. You know, like if we could take 2% for the wage increase and half a percent for the step increases, it would just seem like when I talk to people, they, they one person's getting a 1.1% increase and a, a new employee's getting a two and a quarter or two and a half percent increase. It's like the step raises used to be separate from the wage increase. And I don't think they mind competing for the wage and, and being evaluated on their, their work performance but it's like it's not equal because one person could only work for the county for six months and he's gonna get five shares and I've been working there for 20 years, I got the same score, I get two shares. So I think it's, there's some way of splitting that up, you know, like 2% for a wage increase and a half a percent for the share increase, it would make the workers feel like they're competing on an even keel, you know? Well, to answer your question, there are many ways to, to uh, provide for pay increases. I think it was probably Four years ago, we received, I think, a fairly clear direction from the board, uh, uh, which at that point uh, was, and it was a majority of the board, obviously there were differences of opinion, but there was a fairly strong majority of the board that uh, actually put in the resolution that no more pay increases would, of any kind would be allowed unless and until they were all entirely uh, performance or merit-based. So, yeah, so act, acting on that instruction from the board, that policy directive, you know, we implemented uh, a merit-based system uh, and uh, I'm, I'm pleased with the system overall. It's, it's always difficult to do, to do this and there, there are many ways of looking at it and there are gonna be many different opinions on it. But yes, certainly we have at least three components, I would say, that include, are included in our current merit-based system. There's uh, step or longevity type increases you know, length of service and experience need to be accounted for, and to some extent they are in our merit pay plan. Uh, there's, there's a pay purely based on, on merit and how well the employee is doing in his or her job, and there's also a cost of living type increases. Those are all folded together into that one merit pay increase. And uh, of course they can be separated. There, there are many ways to do that, and uh, if the board, uh, makes a policy choice uh, to move in a different direction, you know, we, we can always do that. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Bender. Seeing no other speakers, that will conclude the human resources and payroll budget. Thank you, Director Collard. Before moving on to finance, we'll give uh, Supervisor Singstock an opportunity to answer, ask his question, and, and, and Executive Harris to, to respond. Under, uh, under it says property tax levy limit 2007, uh, item number two. <clears throat> I want to try and explain this mainly for a lot of the new members of the county board, which I don't think they understand this. The state determines the maximum that we can tax the, the Winnebago County. And they have a formula that consists of two, two numbers. <clears throat> the actual base amount of the prior year and any net new construction. They put those two numbers together and they create, they say in Winnebago County, this is the maximum. So in a way, that's good. You say, well, they're trying to hold down the taxes. So that's a plus. The opposite of that, though, is that if you <clears throat> lower your base, where it says here in that, paragraph, I mean in that sentence that says, using the prior year actual levy as the base. So what they're telling you, what the state's telling you there is if you lower your base by say a million dollars, you lost that million dollars forever because you lowered your base. 
So I just wanted to clarify that, add that to what Mr. Harris was saying. Thank you, Supervisor Singsta. Okay, moving on to the next budget, and that would be the finance budget. The chart of personnel for the finance budget is on page 153. The finance department will have six full-time employees in 2019, the same as 2018. Their tax levy is actually reduced from 765,000 to 733,000 and the list of significant changes is on page 154. Any questions in regards to the finance budget? I'll call on Supervisor Brunn. No, I, I noticed the property liability uh, changed quite a bit. Is that accurate because I would assume that was something that should always be going up as you have more property. Is there an accurate inventory of our property? Yes, there's an accurate inventory of the property. What we did is we had a larger fund balance than we need to keep in here. We need to keep 20 times our claims for the year. And so we had a very healthy fund balance. So we wanted to spread that savings to all the departments. So you'll see in all departments, uh, budgets the, their property and liability will be lower but the the rate and premium stayed the same for our properties so we did not decrease property so I, I feel very confident with the inventory and you're good with our inventory because I know if you don't have proper inventory exactly it's not covered yes we keep very good inventory and um, Doug in my office um, takes care of that with the premiums too so I feel very confident with that okay but Thank we you. just like I said spread the savings to all departments Thank you, Supervisor Brunn. Next speaker is Supervisor Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vicki, on your 2019 goals, number six is to replace all Canon copiers in the county. Is it just that they're getting old and unserviceable, or are yeah. you dissatisfied with that brand, or what's the we're going to keep with Canon, but just replace them. It's the, the life of them. And so we're going to replace them. We're on an operating lease, so we're able to just keep the lease going. We think we. We don't have the, uh, the costs yet, but we think we might actually see some savings from it. And again, what we do is we put that expense into our general services, and then we allocate it out as a revenue and general services to all the departments um, based on what they print, and we charge them eight cents per color copy and three cents per black and white. So that's kind of how we do that. But it'll stay the same, and it's just to keep our inventory um, fresh. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Supervisor Snyder. Seeing no other speakers, that. Supervisor Deffering. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I noticed that there is a, um, and this is something that I've been seeing a lot in, a, in various departments, is that there um, seems to be an increase uh, to, of um, fees for a uh, uh, software vendor for support. It, uh, um, kind of wondering what um you know if this is the same software vendor that's uh, supporting like all the departments or if it's just um um you know if it's coming from one company or are they um and wanted to know what software vendor is increasing their fees and um you know if we're open to bid for the next year sure i can answer that uh tyler munis and it's our ERP system, our enterprise resource planning system that we do all of our counting on, all of our payroll and so forth. So you'll see a, a pretty good increase in, um, in the HR budget as well. So it's the HR budget and myself are what take the expenses for this. Uh, what I, I had an analysis that I could share with you that um, the other previous finance director did as well. And every year it's about a 9.95% increase altogether. And that has to do with database management as well as um, upgrade on the software. I know we used to use PeopleSoft, and I, I, I'll be guessing on how many years we've been on Munis, but I want to say at least six, seven years on Munis. Um, coming from different places, the different softwares, this software is very, very user-friendly for all the departments to use, and I, I think it's a good system. The city of Oshkosh uses it as well. 
but it's something we you know definitely could look into. Do you think that uh, uh, that increase you know is um, you know appropriate? I saw the same thing with other with like people soft and so forth. I feel like in a way they you know they're, you're so ingrained with the software they know you to a degree are stuck with that increase unless you totally re-implement a whole new software package. But they are very good at supporting us, what I've seen so far, and helping us with our needs. Um, and it's been a very reliable software. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Defferding. Next speaker is Supervisor Eisen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Vicki, would you be able to uh, present uh, to the board at some special orders session, uh, a uh, presentation on the CAFR. Uh, that's a financial tool uh, that uh, perhaps many new supervisors are not familiar with, and uh, you can refresh uh, the uh, more seasoned ones as well. It would actually be my pleasure. I, when I first started here, I asked Doug uh, in my department who puts the CAFR together. It's called the Comprehensive Annual Financial Report. I asked him, you know, does the board get it? Do we present? And he said no. And I think it's really important because because you're all looking at the budget of what we're expecting. But the CAFR actually shows you what actually happened. And then, like uh, Supervisor Eisen had pointed out before, it shows where we came in under budget in certain areas and why. And uh, Doug does an excellent job putting that CAFR together, and I would love for us to present it. And if you wouldn't mind, we would do that on an annual basis after the auditors have published it. So in a July. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Eisen. We'll make sure we get one on a future mm -hmm. agenda. Seeing no other uh, questions or comments, that will conclude the finance budget. Uh, thanks for your responses, Director mm -hmm. Fitzgerald. Thank you. So moving on to the next budget, and that would be UW Fox Valley. UW Fox Valley doesn't have any employees by the, the county. The employees are paid for by the state. The counties are uh, responsible for uh, the, the capital investment in the campus, for instance, over time, as a communication arts center and engineering classrooms. Our budget is shared with Allegheny County. Uh, and uh, I believe our share of the levy for 2018 is roughly 148000 and that's actually down from last year's levy of 152. And that's on page 424. Questions or comments? I see uh, Supervisor Singstock. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Harris, can you give us an update regarding this UW uh, merger stuff and how that's going to affect the Fox Valley? I'd hey. like to refer that back to the dean. Correct. We have, uh, we have Dr. Martin Root here, who is the Dean of UW Fox Valley in the back. He certainly can answer your question. I would, I would be happy to provide a brief update. My name is Martin Rudd, the Assistant Chancellor for the Access Campuses, uh, and now an employee at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. So in uh, October of 2017, the uh, president of the UW system, uh, President Cross, announced that uh, UW Fox Valley and UW Fond du Lac would be joining with UW Oshkosh as part of a larger UW system restructuring. So we've been at this about a year. Um, in November of 2017, the Board of Regents approved the, uh, the joining of the campuses. And on the 1st of July 2018, UW Fox Valley and UW Fond du Lac officially became campuses of the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. Um, since about uh, December and, and January of 2018, we've been hard at work on this transition. It's a very complex um, organizational change. We are bringing together three institutions with different cultures, um, a different set of employees, uh, different mission and different values together um, to, to three campuses, one university. Um, from the perspective of the University of Wisconsin system, uh, and our local perspective, this uh, joining is probably going the best of all of those within the uh, university system. 
Uh, we've got about 35 working groups who are working through the uh, very big number of details that are, that are present in this, in this transition. We've got groups looking at faculty policies. We've got groups looking at administrative policies. Um, uh, uh, to give you an example, um, the, the two institutions, the University of Wisconsin Colleges, um, the Fox and Fond du Lac campuses and UW Oshkosh actually have different academic calendars. So we've had to merge our academic calendars for next year. We're creating a single curriculum uh, for the students to take um, so that uh, next year students at uh, all three locations will be offered the same, uh, the same curriculum. Uh, one of the big strengths of this joining is that there will be an opportunity for us to have baccalaureate uh, degree completion programs through UW Oshkosh um, in the Fox Cities location in Menasha and in Fond du Lac. And we're already beginning to think about the types of degrees that our citizens need um, in order to find the jobs that, uh, that are out there today. Uh, I'm certainly happy to answer any specific questions. The um, business as usual on the campus, um, UW Fox Valley was the only campus of the former two-year system that had an increase in enrollment um, this year. The, the enrollment ticked up by uh, 11 students, um, uh, which we were thrilled about. That's in part due to our, our uh, um, impressive and aggressive uh, recruitment of international students. We have 75 international students on the Fox campus ha uh, happily taking English prep classes and uh, matriculated into our uh, liberal arts curriculum. Please go ahead, Supervisor Singstar. Yeah, I have a question or two. Regarding the building, <clears throat> out of game in Winnebago owns the building. Um, what will happen, I mean, number one, my first question would be, do you think down the road some point they may, the state may want to buy the building from us and take it over? Uh, the, the short answer to that is no. Um, the, the, the sentiment of the Board of Regents and the President was that uh, our local operations would continue for the Fox Valley and the Fond du Lac campuses. Uh, we believe it's the, the best arrangement that we can possibly have. We get local support from local dollars for our local students uh, taking local classes here in our communities. And so we see uh, no reason to do that. And I can tell you that, the, that in many ways we have um, uh, greater support from you as, uh, as uh, supervisors of your local campus than, uh, than it can be to get building projects done on some of the four-year comprehensive campuses. So for that, I thank you. One other example. Well, Supervisor I, Singstock, if you could please uh, speak into your mic just uh, so that everyone can hear the question. Uh, the, other, the other thing I'm, I'm wondering about, uh, let's say they, they, uh, the state wants uh, us to make a change to, to the building, some kind of a change. And whether in the other game in Winnebago says, no, we don't agree, we don't think that's necessary, how would that issue be resolved? We, we continue to operate under the uh, agreement that was developed by, between the Board of Regents and, uh, the, and the counties. And so um, the, the, the state can't make those changes. The University of Wisconsin Oshkosh knows clearly through Chancellor Levitt, because I brief him on, on the relationship that uh, Outer Gamey County and Winnebago County have with the campus in, in Menasha. Uh, operating through our board of trustees, and there are uh, uh, two trustees and alternates here tonight, um, that, is the, that is the mechanism by which um, we as a campus bring any potential physical changes to the facility. Um, and, and some of those are actually listed as, as part of the small capital uh, items in the budget. So the, um, we have one of the things that we do have access to now, uh, which we didn't before, is that the Oshkosh campus has a director, uh, a director of uh, planning and a director of facilities um, uh, who, who's a trained architect. And so what we do have now is the advantage of, of um, technical and, uh, and um, uh, facilities eyes on our building that perhaps um, are at a higher level than we did previously. Thank you, Supervisor Singstar. Next speaker is Supervisor Warnke. <clears throat> has there ever been, has there been a, some kind of an arrangement made where 
the counties that don't participate in this UW Fox system uh, where they would pay more. In other words, I've always felt that it's been unfair that um, Winnebago County and Outagamie County support these buildings and we have put in millions of dollars into these buildings. And uh, these other people come from different counties, Wapaka, Calumet, all the way, all around, and they are more or less, the counties are not paying anything. How will you make this up? Uh, I just think it's not fair. I, I can take a, take a stab at that answer. So uh, between 75 and 80% of the students uh, that attend UW Fox, and there are 1,300, 1,297 this year as headcount come from our two counties, Outer Gaming and Winnebago County. After that, the percentages drop off pretty precipitously. 3% of our students come from Brown County, 11% um, from others, um, including, you know, Vernon, Dodge, um, th there's a lot of counties. So, so the percentages that come from other counties are really uh, pretty small. And, and this is the, the only by-county agreement that a UW campus has. And so uh, I, I think, I think to, to go into a position where there would be a request for 3% of the operating budget uh, to come from Brown County, and, and it, it, would be, it would be variable, unmanageable, and probably unwieldy to, to request minor amounts. The, the, the two counties share the cost because the campus happens to straddle the, the, the county line. And uh, in all of the other counties, in all of the other um, former two-year campuses, um, there was an arrangement either with a county or with a city or with a city and a, and a county. And so um, uh, I enjoy working with uh, the two counties, but I could not imagine trying to work with four or five counties on, on a relatively small operating budget. You get great value for your Winnebago County students for the, for the dollars that you put in here. Well, I still think it's unfair. I think that these counties should be paying some kind of a surcharge because their counties don't contribute. But I guess we disagree on that, and um, there's nothing I can do about it. But I just wanted my feelings felt. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Warnke. Next speaker is Supervisor Fari. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it might not be... Uh Correct, but my question will go to the chairman of the UW Extension Committee, Mr. Schneider. Uh, I'm reading this chart, and uh, I guess I'm a little behind the curve here. Uh, we uh, currently have six full-time employees. This chart tells me we're going to four full-time employees. That's, that's tomorrow. We go to the, uh, extension. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm on the wrong one here. Thank you, Supervisor Fari. Yes, excuse me. Next speaker is Supervisor Wojciechowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And having, being the representative kind of that represents the campus and students, I do want to echo what was said that talking to students and administration, this is a very complicated process. And they have many working groups. I'm even on a few of them. And they do involve students and everyone. So it is a really well done uh, you know, organization that's being done. Um, and just the comments that were made earlier about if the state would ever purchase buildings, I think administration and people do appreciate having it done through the counties. We just had, I know if you've noticed on campus, the rec, rec, recplex, as it's called, was just built. And I know a lot of people said, well, why are we spending money on this? But it was bought like 10 years ago through the state because it took so long to finally get that money. Um, and that's usually the case with a lot of projects. Uh, my question, though, is because of this merger, and I know the idea is, or at least one of them, is to get students to go to the two-year and then eventually transfer to UW Oshkosh to finish. Do you foresee maybe an influx of students and buildings being used more, and will repairs go up because of that, or will we have to increase buildings because of maybe more students going to the two-year campuses? Uh, I'll, I'll try and answer that in two parts. Um, firstly, uh, in fact, just today, we've been examining long-term demographic changes in the state, um, particularly around the uh, 
um, uh, entering college age population, high school graduates, and um, you, many of you may know that nationwide that's been uh, declining, and we've seen that in the state of Wisconsin as well. In fact, um, one could argue that that was one of the reasons why uh, President Cross actually developed this uh, this um, uh, joining, because some of the two-year campuses, not the Fox and Fond du Lac campuses, but some of them had seen precipitous um, enrollment declines. We're in a very strong economy at the moment, 2.9% unemployment is sending a lot of kids from uh, directly from uh, high school to work. Um, one of the things that we realize in that, in that type of economy is that uh, students may come back at some point for education, especially when the economy begins to cool, and, and surely it will at, at some point. Um, we've had higher enrollments on campus. I'll, you know, I'll be honest, we've had 200 students more on campus in previous years, probably as, as much as uh, four or five years ago. So capacity-wise, we can, we can deal with the classrooms and we and um, you know we, we've 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 experienced those higher enrollments um, uh, sure you know it means extra cars in the parking lot and at one point we had to to rent parking space uh, over at Sabre lanes um, to have additional parking facilities but um, uh, one of the great things that the counties did was that they foresaw the need for for an increased um, engineering uh, facility on campus and um, when we uh, when we redid the engineering facility, the uh, Platteville Collaborative Engineering Facility in 2012, when it opened in 2012, um, the uh, supervisors from this county and Outagamie County uh, purchased and renovated that facility with a capacity of 400 students. And so the beautiful thing about our joining with UW Oshkosh now is that uh, Oshkosh and Platteville are great bedfellows for engineering programs, and we are now able to offer a, a full cadre of, of uh, back baccalaureate degree programs in engineering technology and mechanical and electrical engineering um, to meet that capacity that's in the, the Fox Valley at the moment. And um, uh, the joining now gives us an opportunity to grow the program into that building. So um, sure, with, with any growth, there can, there can be increased um, um, wear and tear on facilities, but I don't, I don't foresee anything outside of our strategic plan that would, that would cause that to happen. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor Wojciechowski. Next speaker, Supervisor Snyder. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I might add just to dovetail on, I, I heard a comment before about uh, us owning the buildings. Um, lately, our director of facilities, Mike Elder, and, the, uh, and his counterpart from Outagamie County have been meeting regularly with the uh, uh, UW Fox people and now the Oshkosh people to just try to demonstrate and identify any efficiencies that we can help out with uh, because you know our these facilities are owned by the county so the county facilities people should be involved so i just wanted to let the people on the board know that it's not we're not trying to get out of any of this uh, we're we're trying to help and be as efficient as we can thank you thank you supervisor snyder and next speaker is supervisor smith Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my question is, are, how well is our two-year campus here working with the associate degree programs from the tech school system? Do, is there a lot of cooperation? So uh, I'll, ex I'll explain that a little bit. So the technical college system and the university system are two very distinct right. systems in, in Wisconsin and purposely kept that way. In fact, um, I might argue that because of the UW merger, we'll probably be kept that way because from time to time there was talk about joining the two-year uh, campuses with the technical colleges. Um, that's, that's now far removed from, from a, a possibility now that the uh, two-year campuses have come under the auspices of the, of the four-year comprehensive universities. Um, uh, we continue to offer just a single associate degree. It's a, an associate degree called the Associate of Arts and Science, and its primary purpose is to transfer 60 credits of liberal arts education for students to go anywhere within Wisconsin, um, hopefully wider, um, uh, and to transfer those 60 credits or two years so that they can complete baccalaureate degrees. Um, there is very little overlap 
um, except in a few general education credits with the technical colleges. So a couple of examples. Um, many technical colleges uh, offer associate degrees, as you pointed out, that are between 64 and 68 credits. Um, but typically, they only require 18 to 21 credits of general education to complete those. There's a lot of, there's a lot of technical and vocational work in those, um, whereas our students are taking the 60 credits of general education before completing 60 credits of their major. Um, um, so um, uh, our degrees uh, don't overlap. Uh, except in a few core classes like psychology, which is required for many technical colleges uh, degrees, uh, perhaps a writing and a, and a college algebra. The University of Wisconsin system and the technical college system have agreements in place that, th that 30 credits of general education will transfer between those two institutions. That's been sort of um, um, legislatively mandated. It's not as good as in other states, but it's, but it's, it's an okay start. Thank you. Uh, one, just an add-on to this, seeing the changes in the uh, uh, technologies, electronics, as well as uh, things like computers and robotics, I foresee in the future more cooperation between the campuses in those areas because of the overlap. Are you talking between the technical colleges and the yes. and the university? So I can tell you that we're very blessed in this part of the state to to uh, all be members of an organization called the Northeast Wisconsin Educational Resource Alliance. It's a it's a partnership of all of the technical colleges, all of the four year colleges, and the former two year campuses of the UW and the College of Menominee Nation, and uh, together. It was that group that put together what is really a nationwide unique program in engineering technology. So students in engineering technology can start at a technical college, move to UW Fox, complete the degree at UW Green Bay or UW Oshkosh. And so we, we do work together that is, that is well beyond what others do in the state. And so as a result, we have uh, a close and un an understanding collaborative relationship. We, we do good things. That was, a, that was an employer requested degree program mm -hmm. uh, from, from employer surveys and, and we listened and, 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 and did what we, what we should um, when, when the marketplace came calling. Well, I'm glad to hear that. I was involved with the tech school system back in the mid 70s and this is what we had worked for. Thank you, Supervisor Smith. Seeing no other call-ins, that concludes the UW Fox Valley budget. Thank, Thank you, you, Dr. Mr. Chairman, Lund for coming here this evening. And with that, that includes our uh, concludes our budget review for this evening. So, just before we entertain a motion to adjourn, reminder: we will start at 8:30 tomorrow morning. We'll start with the treasurer's budget and then move through the sequence as outlined. Plan to break for lunch a little before noon to give us time. Until 8.30 tomorrow morning. Eight, okay. Yeah, I'll move. We adjourn until 8.30 a.m. tomorrow, October 31st. 30th. 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 Or whatever. Yeah. Yeah.